Good morning, everyone. How you doing? You all right? Good to see you all. Um, yeah, I hope you've had a, a fantastic weekend. Obviously, as you know, we're not able to be in our church building today, but not to worry. Um, here we all are. And I'm sure you'll join me in, in praying good health for, for um, Dawn and the family um, and anyone else that's uh, struggling or suffering, any family members, things like that. So uh, we do pretty good health and hopefully next weekend we'll be, be back in our, in our building in, in Glasgow. So um, I'm just going to pray, come at our service this morning. So, Father, we thank you that in these ever-changing circumstances, you, you are the same. And that is why we are here this morning together to, to worship you. And thank you for the tools that we have and adaptability to, to go with the flow. Um, and we know that regardless of where we are in our living rooms, whether we're on holiday or wherever we are, Father, that you are with us, your spirit is here. And I just I commit this service to you, Father, for you to move and for you to do what you always do. And we trust you in your holy name. Amen. So folks, we're just going to uh, start our service uh, furthermore and worship together. Um, and after our first song, Peter's going to come um, and just update us on what's happening and anything else we need to know. So let's worship. Good morning folks, uh, nice to see you this morning. Uh, welcome to ACC Sunday Worship online. And um, yeah, uh, we're not quite as we expected to be this morning. Um, I think most of you probably know by now that uh, the Palmer family have been tested positive for C19. So uh, first and foremost, we, uh, we want to pray for Don, Kirsten, Phil and Cameron that they uh, recover uh, well and soon and uh, get back to normal as soon as possible. Um, the, the leadership um, sort of did think about whether or not it was safe to, to, visit, to, to meet in the church today, but uh, there was still some on, ongoing dialogue with the tests and trace people, so we just decided overall it was best if we just um, did it uh, online this morning. So hopefully um, we'll pray that uh, next Sunday we're back to, back to normal. Um, as far as this week coming is concerned, um, Still kind of in school holiday mode, so um, there's not an awful lot happening at church-wise. Um, the only midweek activity really is our care and share ministry on Thursday. Um, and we will be slightly short-handed on that, um, obviously because of Dawn's situation. Um, so um, if you're able to help out on Thursday at care and share, then uh, either contact Dawn or Claire and um, let them know um, that you're available, available to help. And I'm sure they'll be grateful. Claire would be very grateful. For, for your help. Um, other than that, not an awful lot to, to pass on. Um, uh, we just uh, continue to pray for all members of our church community who, who need our prayers in whatever situation that is. So we just do that now and um, look forward to spending the rest of our service uh, uh, with, with Nicole. Thanks, Nicole, for, for pulling all this together. I really appreciate it. And also to the technical team for, for making it all happen, especially Timothy. So um, just before we continue, let's just pray. Um, pray for Nicole, pray for Don as he speaks to us later on, and uh, let's just do that now. Father God, we thank you that despite all the challenges that we face, we can still meet together like this. And we just ask your blessing and your touch on our, our time of worship here this morning. Um, although we continue to struggle with the circumstances, Lord, we know that you are uh, the God, the great God above all, that you are there, that you love us, you care for us, and that... Um, we know that with your help and if we put our trust in you, we'll come through this and we'll soon be back together again. So we just pray for our, for our church family, for any who, who need you in a special way, um, any who's struggling health-wise, um, whether that's physical, mental, or whatever situation, we just pray that you'll be close to them. Pray for Nicola, she needs us this morning, ask your blessing on her, and also on Dawn as he speaks to us uh, later on and as he brings that message from your word to us. So be with us, Lord. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Um, okay, kiddos, hope you're ready. Phil's going to come just now and um, speak to you. Uh, and once Phil has uh, done that, we're going we're gonna to sing a song together. So get ready, get your attention, pass over to Phil. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Uh, now, I'm going to hope for some interaction this morning from all ages, not just the young ones. So feel free to either type in your answers to the chat or if you're, 
if you're under 10, you're allowed to shout out and we'll just see how it goes. Okay, I need to share my screen first of all. So let's see if I can do that. And there we go. Hopefully that's all working now. So today I want to talk about how far we can go in the world, either high or low or, or, or wide or deep. And I've got some pictures of some people in church who've been to some different places to do some different things. So you've got to try and tell me if you know who these people are and where they are. This is the first one. There is a bit of a clue in this one. Do you know who that is? Colin. And it's Colin. Colin. Excellent. It's Colin. And can you guess where he is? There's a bit of a clue. Mount Everest. Exactly. He's at Mount Everest. And he's Why at the base he camp. Why is he wearing sunglasses? Because I think it, the snow is very bright. I think that's why you wear sunglasses when you're going to wear Now, I'm hoping Colin might tell us how high he was at when he was at base camp, although he says his internet's very dodgy this morning. Can you tell us, Colin? Silence. Well, it's 18,500 feet. Hey! 18,500 feet. Isn't technology wonderful when it works? Thank you, Colin. That's fantastic. 18,000 feet. That's really quite high. 18,000 feet, Colin's been. Um, we'll need to see if anyone can beat that. Very high, 18,000 feet. Okay, so that's how high someone's been in our church. Here's the next one. This is a very difficult one. I doubt anyone's going to get who this is. Because this was many years ago, and I don't think he's got hair like this anymore. David. No. Oh, the adults are going to have to guess. I can't get the chat up, which doesn't help either. He, he was working the camera when we were live in church. Never count Kemp. It's Kemp. I heard someone say it. I think that was Helen. Yeah. <laughs> it's Kemp. It's Kemp uh, with, his, with his oxygen tank and his regulator underwater. Now, Kemp, how deep, how deep did you go, Kemp? It's Kemp there, calling Kemp. How deep did you go? 10, Ten meters, he says. 10 meters, he says, thank you. I've got so many screens here, I can't get the chat, can't get the chat open as well. All right, so that's about 30 feet, 10 meters. My goodness, if you got into trouble there, someone would have to come down and, 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 and rescue you. I suppose if Colin got into trouble in base camp, someone would have to come a long way to rescue him. Okay, here's one more. Who's that with the hat on? Do we know Peter. who that is? Peter. It's Peter. So Peter's out in a boat. Now, Peter, how far away from land have you, have you ever been in a sailing boat? Um. On that particular sailing boat, well, it was in the middle of the Firth of Clyde, so I would guess probably one or two miles. Okay, and have you ever been further from land in a boat? Uh, in a in a big sh in a in a ship, but not in a boat like that, no. Okay, but in a in in, in, a, in a big ship, so you could oh. end up being many miles from land, and of course, if something happens and you need to be rescued, there's a long way to come if you're many many miles from shore. So we've got someone who was a long way from shore, someone who was very high up a mountain, someone who was deep down underwater. I've got one other picture that's far away. Now the adults may need to help here. This is not a person, this is an object. Does anyone, does anyone know what that is? It's a satellite. Oh, I heard someone say it. Begins with a V. It's a satellite. I said it, I said it, it's Voyager 1, I said it. Oh, you said it. Well done, the clever McNaughts. It's Voyager. It's Voyager. And I had to look up how far Voyager is away now. This is, a, this is a little spacecraft, kids, that was launched probably when your parents were born. In fact, for some of you, probably before your parents were born. <laughs> this, that's probably older than some of your parents. Um, it was launched in about 77, I think. It's now 14 billion miles from Earth. 
14 billion miles. It's gone past Pluto. It's gone past the solar system. It's like in deep space now. And it's still going. It's incredible. It's still flying away from our solar system. Now, all these things tell us how far away we can get, how high or how low or how far away, like Voyager spacecraft. And it reminds me of one of my favorite passages in the Bible, which is this one. And it says, if I climb up to the sky, it's a bit like Colin, you are there. If I go underground or underwater, like Kemp, you are there. If I flew on the morning's wings or on a sailing boat to the far western horizon, you would find me in a minute. And I think you could add in, if you were even sitting on Voyager, you are already there waiting. You know, these are words about God, which remind us that no matter where we go, God's there. Whether we're up a mountain, whether we're in the middle of the ocean, whether we're on the moon, or one day people go to Mars, think of that. God's already there. God's already on Mars. <laughs> and he will be there when anyone ever does get there. So if at some point you're going to go back to school next week, some of you might be going back to school or some of you may have a, a, your week off just now, I want you to remember that wherever you are, in the classroom or in school or wherever you are, God is right there with you. He's always there with you. And you just have to whisper to him in your mind and he will hear everything you say and will be right beside you. Let's just pray for a, a quick moment. Father God, thank you for those words in the Bible that tell us that no matter where we go, you are there. And we thank you that wherever we go this week, whether we're at school or at work or at home, you will be there very near to us. Amen. Thanks so much, Phil. I'm just going to pass over to the young Johnny Bell, um, who's going to lead us in prayer for a time. Thank you, Nicole. Um, intercessory prayer. Um, just ahead of praying, um, I um, constructed the prayer into kind of three or four areas, I guess. And there's one part, the end part. I was just, um, it just kind of added in at the very end in, in, in some respects as I kind of reflected on on the week that I have had um, and that's why there's a little bit of I in there but I just wanted to um, invite us all to consider that you are the I in that part of the prayer as well. Um, very clear that we've, we've had a week of ups and downs with highs and lows, um, a week of distress for some, a week of questions um, a week of excitement, hopefully for some as well. A week of peace. Um, a week of um, a week for me when I lost my my grand. She was a hundred and one, and for pretty much all those a hundred and one years, gave her life for Christ. And uh, she went to be with um, her father in heaven, her father in heaven. But it was a time to reflect and a time to question. Um, so. When I get to the end, I'll, I'll just kind of pause before I get onto the last um, kind of paragraph and, and just let you start to kind of ponder about the last week and maybe the week that's coming up uh, for you as well. So let's pray. Mighty God, thank you that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Jesus said that he would build the church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Lord, fill your church with the security that comes from knowing we are protected by you. Fill us too with boldness to reach others. You are able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or imagine, according to the power at work within us. To you be glory throughout all generations forever and ever. Heavenly Father, protect your church from attacks and persecution. Use your church rather to provide a haven of safety and refuge for those in need. Use your church to extend your kingdom in this world. Use your church to bless the communities in which they are placed. Use your church to refresh and revive the weary and hurting. Use your church to equip your people for works of love and service. Use your church to proclaim the joyous message of the gospel. Use our ACC's social ministry to demonstrate your faithfulness to a watching world. And Father God, please protect our church leaders, all those that serve daily the community you have asked us to meet from attack and fill them with fresh vision as they shepherd your people. 
strengthen their spirit and restore their souls through the work of your Holy Spirit. May they find rest in your loving care. And for ourselves and for you individually. Eternal Father, you are indeed strong to save. I come to you with these burdens and I confess that sometimes I essentially harbor unbelief when it comes to relying on you to help me with them. Forgive me for allowing these things to interfere with my delight in you. Lord, I leave every aspect of these problems to your wise and gracious disposal. I choose to firmly believe that your divine counsel will guide me and calm my spirit. Amen. Thank you. And Johnny, thank you um, so much. Folks, we're going to go into a, a time of worship um, just before Don comes to speak to us. Um, so what I'm going to do is just pray for Don uh, before we sing. Um, and then Don will, will, will come and share his heart with us. So, Father, thank you again, as always, for Don, his leadership. And thank you for his um, resilience and through feeling rubbish with this. With this virus, he still wants to come and, and serve us and serve us, his family. So we pray um, your spirit move through what he has to say today and that you will, you will move us, Father. Amen. Good. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And... Um, Thank you for joining us today, and um, it's good to be with you. Uh, first of all, before I get into the message, uh, I just want to pass on uh, our thanks as a family for everyone who has been in touch. You'll forgive us for not responding to everyone individually, uh, to the offers. Uh, if we did, I think we would have more food in our house than anyone on the south side of Glasgow. So we've had many, many um uh, invitations uh, from people to bring food to us. Uh, of course, we're, we're always um, willing to open our door and see uh, any food that's there. But again, thank you. We really appreciate your prayers. We appreciate your support. Um, just want to take a couple of minutes just to let you know how we are, because everyone's asking, how are you doing? Um, we're actually fine. Um, we uh, probably started about a week ago. Um, uh, last weekend, Philip started to feel uh, quite poorly. We thought it was a heavy cold that he had. And by Tuesday, Kirsten and I had felt um, flu-like symptoms. We both had slight coughs. We had a fever on Tuesday evening um, and aches and pains. Um, but because Kirsten works for the NHS, her, um, her boss advised her and all of our family who are living here in this house to be tested. So we did it um, on Thursday morning. We went through to the York Hill Hospital um, and we all got tested. Um, we didn't have very many symptoms by that stage at all, apart from a few aches and pains. And um, on Friday night, we, uh, about 10 o'clock at night, we all got the message at the exact same time. And there were these kind of gasps around the house uh boys were in one room i was in another i think kirsten was upstairs uh so we all tested positive um we're we're doing fine now we we don't really have coughs or anything um but obviously we have to self-isolate and how it works if you don't know is you self-isolate for 10 days from when you first got the symptoms so for us um uh, certainly for kirsten and i it will be until fri this coming friday so uh, as a family, we will have to isolate until Friday. Uh, the one we feel the most for is Cameron because he had to quarantine for two weeks and his quarantine uh, ended yesterday. So he now has to have another week uh, having quarantined for two weeks already. Um, but, you know, that's what we have to do. So again, thank you for inquiring about us. Uh, it it kind of just feels like the after effects of a heavy cold. Um, and, and in some ways, we feel a bit famous now. You know, when you hear about somebody who has it, you think, oh, wow, uh, we know somebody. So we kind of feel a bit famous, if that makes sense to you. Um, and there we go. But again, 
Uh, I know I'm repeating myself, but we do appreciate your, your concern. Okay, so uh, today we're going to uh, continue in the series on the parables. And uh, I've got a slide to share with you just now. So here we go. Uh, we started this series last week, and um, we're looking at basically Matthew chapter 13. So I'm going to be reading some verses from Matthew 13 this morning uh, in two parts in our service. Uh, so we'll come to those in just a wee minute. So parables. Um, we started this series last week, but before we get into the parable for today, which is one of the most famous parables that Jesus ever told and was probably the first parable. He, he, told, he gave some illustrations uh, from life before this one, but this, most scholars agree, this was the first official parable per se that he told. Um, and we'll come to it in a wee minute. I want to ask a question of you. How many types of people do you think there are in the world? Now, Phil has already done an amazing kids talk for us today to talk about the different um, where, places that people in the world go to. Some people go very high, some people go very low, some people go very far, some people go very wide, and God is there. So I want you to think for a moment, how many types of people do you think there are in the world today? Now, the idealist answer is, of course, only one because we're all human. And in a sense, that's true. Wherever we go, as Phil said, God is there. Whatever we've achieved in our life, whatever kind of humans we are, and whatever we've done in our lives, where we come from, we are one. And that's true. But then other people think, no, it's not just one type of person. Yes, we're all human, but there's at least two groups of people in this world. Those of us who grew up in church, we heard about being saved or being unsaved. And those were two words, two classifications that people used to describe people that knew Jesus and people who didn't know Jesus. In politics, we describe people as being to the left or to the right, whether that's uh, in our country or Democrats and Republicans that we're hearing about all the time. And then, of course, uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, uh, talk recently and uh, concern about uh, black and white and the difference between people. So for some, they say, no, there's two different types of people in the world. We can divide everyone in categories. How about 16? Myers-Briggs uh, classify people according to their personality types. And according to Myers-Briggs type indicator, there are 16 different types of personality in the world. And you're one, and I'm one, uh, and uh, it's important to find out what your personality type is. That can make people different. Oh, we're getting bigger numbers, a bit like Phil's quiz earlier. How about this? 650 different types of people in the world. And where do we get that from? Well, if you research the ethnic groups, that is, how do people identify themselves? Uh, how do they describe themselves? I am, um, you could say, I am Irish. I'm white Irish. Uh, <clears throat> when, we, when the lady called us yesterday from Test and Trace, uh, that was one of the questions that they ask you. What is your ethnic type? And she said, are you white Scottish? I said, I am most certainly not. She said, oh, I thought, no, 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 no. I said, I'm white Irish. And then she went into her category and she says, that category doesn't come up. There is no white Irish in my category. Okay, I said, well, call me something else then. So I'm white British other. <laughs> so uh, there's another way to classify people. But according to Jesus, there are four. And that's what we're going to think about this morning. Uh, according to Jesus, there are basically four types of people in the world. But before we get into Jesus' classification, I want to take you back to a song that got to number one. Now, this song would never get to number one now, not just because of how it sounds. It's actually not very politically correct these days, okay? So I hope I'm not going to offend anyone by playing this song. I hope we're bigger than that. But when I was a wee boy, this song got to number one 
in 1970 and I'm going to play a little clip of it for you right now. Like that little bit of nostalgia, at least Nicole was getting into that. See the kind of music, Nicole, that you missed? Oh my goodness, do you think music is cool now? Well, 1970 music was really cool. We were all swinging on the dance floors to that song, but I wasn't, I was a wee boy. Um, okay. <laughs> Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I actually remember singing that song in Sunday school. But um, of course, that is not how Jesus classified people. And in Matthew chapter 13, we're going to read verses 1 to 8. Jesus describes there are four different types of people in this world. It's nothing to do with the color of their skin, of course. Uh, it's to do with something much more profound than that. And so in Matthew 13, here's the words that we read. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Large crowds gathered around him, so he got into a boat and he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. I'm going to read the other verses a little bit later. Um, many times when Jesus told a parable, he didn't explain it. He told the story. And then he, he let, let it fall, almost like the seed that we've just read. A sower scattering the seed, he let it fall, and people had to figure it out, um, either by turning to God in faith, or they just didn't understand. And so this is one of the few parables he does explain. The, only, the other one in this that he explains is one that Phil's going to preach on very soon. And that's called the parable of the weeds, but we'll come on to that on another week. Okay, so for context, let me remind you what's going on here. Why did Jesus give this parable? Why was this the first parable that Jesus shared with the crowds of people? As we learned last week, Jesus had begun a revolution. Not a revolution with weapons, but a revolution of words, a revolution of ideas, a revolution of actions, of love. And in uh, Mark's gospel, we read that Jesus went into Galilee, the same area where he told these words, this parable, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. So for about a year before we read these words, Jesus has been very active, very busy. Uh, his fame is spreading. His uh, words are spreading. People are hearing his words. They're coming to follow him. In fact, great crowds of people, as we read um, in verse 2, large crowds gathered around him. And the crowds were so large that he has to get into a boat. So they're pressing in on him. And he gets into a little boat, goes out onto the Sea of Galilee, and he preaches and teaches the people uh, and reads about the parable of the sower from the boat as the crowds are listening to him. So, again, I showed this slide last week to remind us of what was happening. There are large crowds of people who are following Jesus, and they are turning to him, and they're believing in him. They're accepting his words. Large, huge crowds of people everywhere he goes. If you turn to the previous chapter, chapter 12, it says that the crowds were so large, Jesus had to go away to lonely places. Like Phil's talk earlier, sometimes he had to go up a mountain. I don't know if he actually went under the water, but he certainly went into boats. And sometimes he went for long walks just to get away from the crowds. 
So many, many people were following Jesus, but on the other side, many others were rejecting him. Unbelief was growing as well. There was increased opposition to Jesus. In chapter 12, for example, the previous chapter, verse 14, it says this, Then the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. So Jesus starts to speak in parables. He starts to speak in words that some people will not understand anymore. And other people will understand them. And this is what it says. It says, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. They did not he didn't say anything to them without using a parable. When he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 13 to his followers. He says, the knowledge of the mystery. Now, if you've got an NIV or a modern translation, yours probably says secret, okay, or secret. And that's true. But the actual word is the word mystery that he uses. And what he's saying is, my words are going to be a mystery to some people now. Okay, a mystery is something that's hidden, okay, that people are trying to find an answer to, but they can't. They can't understand it. They can't figure it out. It's a mystery. It's a bit like watching a program on TV, okay, um, and uh, I'm sure like us, many of you have been watching a lot of TV over the last seven, eight months, and maybe you watch some of these mystery programs, you're trying to figure out who did it, who is the culprit, who committed the murder, but for Jesus, he's saying, my message is going to be a mystery now to some people, and that's why I speak in parables, and so here's some of the questions that people were probably asking in Jesus' day, Jesus, you're talking about the kingdom, that the kingdom is here. How do we really know that the kingdom is here? Okay, because it doesn't seem sometimes like things are changing. On, on some days, we hear about these amazing miracles, Jesus. We hear about the people that you're healing and the people that you're setting free from all of these evil forces inside them. We see the crowds of people following you but then on other times, it feels like the bad guys are winning, okay? We're still under the control of these terrible Romans. Um, there's still people out trying to kill you, Jesus. Uh, is your kingdom here? Really? Are you changing the world? Are you going to change the world? Are people going to make you king, Jesus? What does it mean for you to say that the kingdom is here? because um, you don't look some days very much like a king. So there's these questions going on in people's minds. And for the religious leaders, they hear Jesus saying, the kingdom is here, and they've got questions. Well, this doesn't look like the kingdom that God promised us. When God told us the kingdom would come, he said he's going to remove um, our enemies. He's going to set us free. He's going to make us uh, the, the center of his plans again, okay? We're not going to be oppressed. We're not going to be under the rule of anybody. We're going to be in control of our own destiny, and God's going to come and make us his people. That's not happening. So they were confused. The other questions were more personal questions, and that was this. Who's really in the kingdom, and who's not in the kingdom? You see all these crowds of people following Jesus, are all of them in the kingdom? Everybody? All the men, all the women, all the children? Uh, or, or, or are they not? Are some of those people not really in the kingdom? And how do you tell? How do you know if you're in the kingdom or not in the kingdom? These kinds of questions were going on in people's minds now. And so, Rather than answer the questions, just with words, Jesus tells the story. And this is the story, the parable of the sower. And in the words that we read in the first part of the story, Jesus describes four different types of soil. 
This has been called the parable of the sower. And uh, one of my sons said this week, well, why is it called that? Well, simply because that's how it begins. And you can imagine, couldn't you, when Jesus is telling the story, it's almost like he could say to people, look, look over at that field right now. And look what that man is doing. Because in his culture, that's what they did. They threw the soil, the seed on the soil. And you could probably imagine a sower with a big bag of seed walking out in the field, tossing the seed all over the ground. <clears throat> and so that's why it's called that, because of a sower. And so the question is, who is he talking about? Uh, you could say it's God. God is a sower. Jesus is the sower. But it could also be referring to people like his disciples or to you when you sow the seed. The sower is the person sowing. The seed is always the same. It's not four different types of seed. It's the same seed in every ground, every type of ground. The thing that changes is the ground. So you could call this the parable of the soil because there's four different types of soil. The first type of soil Jesus describes as hard ground. And what he's referring to is the pathway. So there's the when people trample on the pathway, the ground becomes hard. Okay? It's not soft, it's not able to take any seed. And when the soil, when the seed falls in the hard ground, he says the birds come immediately and they eat it, and the, the seed is destroyed. It doesn't grow. That's so the hard pathway that people walk on. That's the first type of soil. The second type of soil he describes is rocky soil. And it means one of two things. It means the soil is literally rocky, so there's rocks under the ground. And so when the seed tries to grow, it hits into these rocks and it, it, it can't go down very deep. And when the sun comes, the plant is destroyed. But it could also mean something else. It could also mean that the soil is quite shallow. And underneath the shallow soil is what they call the bedrock. In other words, some soil has fallen on, on, on this rocky ground, real, real bedrock, and it, it can't go any deeper because of the bedrock under the surface. So basically, the soil uh, is shallow and the seed can't grow. And so when the sun comes, because there's no roots, the plant dies. Third, he describes the thorny ground. So there's lots of soil, okay, for the seed to grow and the, the roots start to go, go deep. But when the roots start to go deep under the ground, the problem isn't so much under the ground. The problem is what's outside the ground. And that is the thorns, the thistles. And uh, I, I read a wee bit about this this week. Thorns and thistles do not like company. That's what um, you can read uh, about thorns and thistles. When thorns and thistles are growing in the ground and when a plant starts to grow, they don't like it. Okay, They attack it. They, they try to choke it. And that's what Jesus says. When the, the, the plant starts to grow, the thorns gather around it and choke it and it dies. The fourth type of soil is the good soil. It's been well prepared. It's ready to receive the seed. The seed falls. The roots go deep down into the soil. It's got deep soil. There's no thorns or thistles to choke it, and it grows, and it is fruitful. So those are the four types of soil. But what is Jesus talking about? Well, let's read the next bit of the parable. So if you go down to verse 18, we're going to read Jesus' explanation of this parable. And as we said earlier, this is one of the few parables that he explains, probably because it was the first one. And that's, and that's why he says, if you've got ears to hear, then listen to me while I say this. Listen, he says, verse 18, to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, but does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the person who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. 
But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the person who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the person who hears the word, understands it, and who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And so as people are listening to this, Jesus says there's basically four types of people in the crowd. There's four types of people in our world back then and even today. And it's all determined by how we respond to the word of the kingdom. Now, in Mark's gospel, Matthew calls it the word of God, and so does Luke. But Matthew says, no, it's not just the word in general. We're not just talking here about when somebody reads the Bible. It's something more specific. It's when someone hears a message, a message about God's kingdom. When people hear that message, how do they respond? Number one, there are people whose hearts are hard. There are people who don't want to hear it. The message goes out, okay? The seed is, is, is thrown out, but their hearts are hardened, and they can't hear it. It's, it's Jesus is saying earlier, you know, there, there are people among them, and it's like their hearts are hard, so he says they can't hear the word. He explains that in, uh, elsewhere in Matthew 13. There are people in our world today who can't hear it. No matter how many times we share it, whether we do it in words and actions, whether we do it on social media, uh, whether it's someone in the street, whether it's personal, whether it's a conversation, whether it's someone you know who's a friend, and you're praying for them, and you're trying to share with them, it's like you're talking to a brick wall. Their hearts are hardened. They cannot receive the message. And that's the first type of people Jesus is saying, people whose hearts are hardened. And I hope there's no one, I don't think there is, because if there anyone was, I don't think you'd be watching and listening today if that's your state. But unfortunately, there's people in our world who just don't want to hear it. Secondly, and by the way, I've met all four kinds of people in my life. There are people who do want to hear the message. And I remember, especially when I was younger, and I was a youth worker, I used to get really excited when people responded to my words. Okay, whether I was in a youth club, or I'm talking to a group of young people, or I'm in a school, sometimes in a university, sometimes doing a mission. Um, I used to do various missions, where, especially in the 1980s and the 1990s here in Scotland in places like uh, Dundee and Tilly Coutry, uh, uh, did some in Edinburgh, some in Glasgow. I used to get really excited when young people responded. And I used to tell people, it was amazing. We had like 10 people respond, we had six people. And one of the, one of the best missions I did was in a little place called Tilly Coutry uh, in Clack Manninshire, uh, the st smallest county in Scotland. And we had about um, 30 young people respond in, during those two weeks. I was so excited. I came back from that and I, I was walking on a cloud I had all these amazing stories to tell about these people. Do you know how many of those young people eventually, eventually actually were in God's kingdom and showed the evidence? One. A young man called Paul, who is still today in a church in Dundee. He, um, he's part of that church, and I met him a few years ago. And I remember speaking to him. I said, Paul, whatever happened to Sally? What happened to Craig? What happened to Johnny? What happened to Gene? What happened to... He says, Don, none of them lasted. Not one. I was devastated because all of these young people responded, but then they fell away. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if the message doesn't get down deep into our lives, if there's no roots and the, the roots are very shallow, 
he says, when the persecution comes. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, when times get tough, if the roots aren't deep enough, it won't survive. When the times get tough, as Billy Ocean used to sing, the tough get going. All right. And if the roots aren't deep enough, it won't be, you won't be strong enough. Thirdly, the thorny ground. Again, I've met people in my life as I've shared the message with them. Um, and some people are coming before my mind right now. I was thinking about them even this morning. So I was going through my message, even some people since coming to Glasgow. And the message goes out and people accept the message. And then after six months, maybe not even as long as that, maybe a bit longer than that, Jesus says two things happen. He says, the worries of this life, verse 22, or the deceitfulness of money. Two things can choke the message. The worries of this life. When people look around them, it, it's like the seed has, has taken root in their heart. It's starting to grow. Many of these people I've actually seen be baptized. But what happens is they never, ever learn to deal with the thorns and the thistles. They never, as it were, let God deal with the stuff that was there before the seed was planted. It's like Jesus will take your message, but we're not going to let you pull out some of these weeds. And maybe Phil's going to talk about that message in a few weeks' time. Okay, we, the thorns and thistles stay in the ground. And it's almost like Jesus saying, let me deal with these things. Let me help you deal with the worries of this life. Or maybe worries come because we don't have enough money or because we're, we're, we struggle. But you know what? Having too much money can also be a pressure. And that's what Jesus says, the deceitfulness of wealth. Some people come and accept the message, but they got a lot of money. They've got too much money. They got too much stuff in their lives. And they don't let Jesus deal with that either. And they think, I can be a Christian and I can have all my riches. Or I can be a Christian and have all my worries. And it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Because the worry or the wealth choke the seed and it dies. And that's what Jesus said. And then finally, there's the fallow ground. For those of you who don't speak English, fallow simply means to... Make the ground ready to receive the seed. It's been plowed. All the thistles and the thorns and the weeds have been taken away. And it's ready to receive the seed. So let me conclude this morning. What's the difference? What is the difference in somebody whose ground, whose heart is ready? And Jesus said, if you look at the passage, there's four things, four more things that are characterized by that person. Four things that mark them out. Number one, he says, they hear. Jesus says, if you've got ears to hear, then hear, listen. These people listen. They want to hear the message. They really, really do. They're listening to it. That's the first thing. Secondly, he says, the one, verse 23, who received the seed. In the original language, the word that's translated received means to welcome. It's the Greek word dekamai, which means to welcome something, to welcome someone. It's like someone comes to your door, you open the door and you welcome them in. This person isn't just listening, they welcome the message. They say, I want it. I want it to come inside me. I want it to change me. I want it to grow inside me. That's the second thing. They receive it. They welcome the message. Thirdly, Jesus says, they understand it. How do you understand it? And this is really important, and I want to stress this today. You don't understand it because you're clever. You don't understand it because you're smart. You don't understand it because you've been to university. Remember what Jesus said? The only way you understand it, this is a mystery, 
as if God reveals it to you. That's how you understand it. You understand it by faith, not by intelligence, not by trying to figure it out. You understand it because you can't figure it out. And you say, Jesus, show me what it means. Teach me what it means. Help me to understand it, Jesus. I need you to open my eyes. I need you to pull back the curtain. I need you to help me in my heart to understand what this means. I really want to understand it. And finally, what happens to someone who listens to the message, who welcomes the message, who starts to understand it? What happens? They start to produce fruit. They start to produce fruit. <clears throat> Again, in the chapter before this, there were people who came to Jesus. <clears throat> and they asked him all kinds of questions. And Jesus says this in verse 33 of the previous chapter. If you make a tree good, that tree will produce fruit. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You recognize a good tree by its fruit. It's about actions. It's about your actions. It's not about your words. It's not about your rituals. As I say, you could be baptized. You could learn all these worship songs. You could know the Bible. That's of, all those things are important. But ultimately, it's about fruit. And fruit means lifestyle. It means these people start to live like Jesus lived. They deal with the worries of this life. They know where to take them to. They deal with their riches. They say, what I have, God, is yours. Okay? They let it get deep down inside them. And so finally today, I want to give you a couple of takeaways. Right before this, do you notice at the start of chapter 13, it says that same day? What day? Jesus had been in a house. And he's in this house and people come to him and they say, your mom and your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside the house, Jesus. Jesus says this, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, my sister and my mother. Luke puts it this way. He said, whoever hears the word of God and puts it into practice is in my family. So the takeaway for us is if we're in God's kingdom, today, we really know Jesus, then what counts in life is doing the will of our Father in heaven. What does that look like for you this week? I, I don't know. What does it look like for you to put things into practice? I don't know. One thing I know is you're going to get opportunities in your place of work. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Not so much on a Sunday morning. It's good that we meet here. What happens is tomorrow, or even today, when you put into practice what you hear, when you listen to it, that's what counts. Am I in the kingdom? Is the kingdom in me? That's what Jesus would ask people. Am I really in it? And is it in me? And then going back finally to these two examples of the, the shallow soil and the thorny soil. Maybe for some of us today, we need to ask this question. Maybe, maybe that seed, maybe that root has stopped growing. And you know what? We can be quite deceptive. And one way, it's easy to kind of join in something like this and to pretend that we're growing. But what happens outside this? What happens when, when the pressure is turned on? Okay? Is there anything in our lives that's stopping those roots from going deep? Maybe we need to deal with it, okay? That's the key between the second and the fourth seed was, was someone saying, Jesus, like, help me get rid of these rocks, <laughs> okay? I don't want these things in my life anymore. I want this. I want to grow. Is there anything today preventing your faith from growing deeper? And then finally, is there anything choking you today? Is there anything choking the seed I want to just pause before I hand back to Nicole and we have our final song. 
And I'm not going to pray. I just want to give us 30 seconds or so just to reflect, each one of us, and say, Jesus, where am I? Where am I in this story? How do I respond to your words? Let's just reflect. Let's respond to the words. And then, Nicole, give us about 20 seconds and then back to you, please. Folks, well, come to the end of our service. Thank you so much for um, for joining today, um, and hopefully we'll see you back in the building next week. I'm going to play another song. Um, it's kind of fits well, and talking about the perseverance through seasons and um, in our attitude towards them and 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 who he is through them. But I just want to share uh, something, you know, with you first, um, and that's this verse in in Hebrews ten. Um, and it says, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised. He is coming. For in just a little while, he is coming. Uh, will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. And that's the promise that we have in him for that strength. That we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Um, and I just want to encourage you this week, today, this week, just to do something that's really good for your soul. Um, because when we do those things and, and we really feel, you know, feel good and uplifted, that's where we see his goodness and see more of who he is. And and, and, and that is, you know, where we, where we need to be in order to, to grow with him. And for myself, a lot of you who, who know me will know over the past few years um, I've not had a lot of courage to do the things that I need for probably longer actually maybe a decade but I've not had the courage to do the things that I've I've needed to do in order to have that that peace or or, or to do things that are good for my soul and um, whether it be leaving my family home after coming back from Australia due to family reasons and being scared to branch out um, or just being scared to try and make changes in my life. And a lot of you know I, I struggle with um, just how I, how I look, my self-esteem and um, things like that and, and resenting everyone else who doesn't have the same metabolism struggles or, or things like that as me and recently making making changes with that too and just branching out as well to um, have a better job and um, get away from my, my bad boss before. And there's loads of things bringing truths to light um, that brings more peace into my life. So whether it be speaking a truth or whether it be um, just reaching out to someone, whatever that may be, do something today or this week that's going to be good for your soul, that shows you who God is and his faithfulness. And let me just say this one more time, that we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Don't throw away your confidence. You need to persevere. So we're going to finish on this song. And thanks again, everyone, for joining. I do love you all. Um, and I'll see some of you hopefully next in the building next Sunday um, and the rest of you on Zoom. But have a lovely Sunday. Um, and I'm going to play this last song. Some of you might have heard it, maybe not. Um, if you want to know what the song is, then give me a shout and I'll, and I'll send you the links to it. But take care, everyone. Have a nice one. Bye-bye. <laughs>